already done so. While you're turning there, I, I brought a, a glove with me here tonight. And, you know, you can do a lot of different things with a glove. You can, uh, for example, work in the hood of your car. Put some, no, I wouldn't recommend with a leather glove. But if you're going to work in the hood of your car, you can put, uh, put some gloves on. Keep your hands from getting too dirty. If you're going to work out in the yard, use a rake, a shovel, or something, swing it at axe. You can wear gloves to keep you from getting blisters or splitters. Um, you can do, uh, some people when they work with raw meat like to put on gloves. And that way they don't get a germ on their hands, they don't have to stop and wash their hands uh, as often when they take those gloves back off. And so you can do a lot of different things with gloves. However, this glove right here is not doing any of those things. Right? I mean, I can't look at this glove and say, like I had to do last week, go change my battery. You know, if you, if you wear gloves and you work in your car, you need to send the glove to go do it. The glove itself doesn't do that, right? I can't say, go rake my leaves, glove. And this glove go and start raking, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? If someone could admit that, get a patent on that, you'd be set for life. But the glove in and of itself is just material. In order for this glove to do something, you've got to do something with it, right? You've got to put your hand inside the glove. Once you put your hand inside the glove now, you can use it to go change your battery. You can use it to go rake your leaves. Why don't I go chase this one? Just kind of give you a little flashback there. But once you put your hand inside the glove, the glove can do anything that you want it to do as long as you're able to do it. Without your hand in the glove, it's just material. But when you put your hand inside this glove, the sky's the limit, isn't it? You know, I think that's kind of like our lives as Christians. We're kind of like this glove. A lot of potential. You can do a lot with this, but unless it's filled up, it's just going to sit there. But when the Holy Spirit of God comes inside our lives, he fills us, and then we can do whatever it is he wants us to do. So you can look at somebody and say, go preach the gospel. Go use a spiritual gift. You know, Go invite someone to church. Go use your gift of showing mercy. And on our own, we can't do those things. But when God's Holy Spirit comes and fills us like putting a hand inside a glove, there's no limit to what we can do. Joel talks about the Holy Spirit tonight in Joel chapter 2. If you've already got there in your Bibles, in order for us to understand what Joel is going to teach us about the Holy Spirit, though, we have to understand the role of the Holy Spirit in Joel's day. Because if we're not careful, we might take what we know about the Holy Spirit now, living in these days, living in the church age. We might take what we think. I've already mentioned things like spiritual gifts. You might be thinking, oh, the fruit of the Spirit. You might be thinking about things the Holy Spirit leads us to do. And we can't read that back into Joel because... That's not how things worked in Joel's day. So if you're in Joel chapter 2, we're going to begin talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the Old Covenant. What the Holy Spirit did way back then in the Old Covenant. And we're going to pick up in Joel chapter 2 verse 28, and then we will finish the chapter. Joel says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those who the Lord calls. In fact, let's read uh, 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Well, we're going to come back to 3, 1 in a minute, so I wanted to include that in there. But we need to talk about what the Holy Spirit was doing before we can really understand and appreciate what Joel says the Holy Spirit will do. Joel begins by pointing to the future. He says there is coming a time after that, he says, in those days, he says the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on who? On all flesh. That's, that's very broad, isn't it? But this does not mean that every single person, once this happens, that every single human, all flesh, is going to have the Holy Spirit. Because unbelievers don't have the Holy Spirit, do they? Those that are unsaved are not spirit-filled. So right away, when he says on all flesh, we have to limit that to all believers. And we're going to get to that part in a second. But what was the Holy Spirit doing in the Old Testament? 
for the old covenant. I, I use those interchangeably. What was the Holy Spirit doing back then? Not filling all flesh. I think a lot of times we might forget that when we read about people in the Old Testament, that they were not spirit-filled. You know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they did not have the Holy Spirit within them. Like you and I have the Holy Spirit within us today. David and Solomon and uh, Elijah and Elisha and, and all the prophets and on and on. We can look at the great people we read about, Moses and Daniel and Jonah. All these people were believers in God, but they did not have God's Holy Spirit within them. That's not what the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit was not universal on all believers. So what did the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit would come upon individuals for a certain time to do a limited thing. So if you were the king of Israel, like David, God's chosen leader, then God would send his Holy Spirit to lead David. He would send his spirit to help David, to assist him. I mentioned prophets like Elijah and Elisha. Now God's Holy Spirit certainly came on those prophets, I believe he would give them information, either something he wanted them to say or something he wanted them to do. But God's Holy Spirit would leave heaven, come down to them, give them a message, and then go back to heaven. God's Holy Spirit would come on people like the judges in the book of Judges. In the Judges, how many times do we read the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson? And then what did Samson do? Usually killed a bunch of Philistines, right? When the Spirit of God came on him, then he did something. What did that mean? Well, it means, well, a minute ago, the Spirit was not on Samson. The Spirit would come and go. David, when he prays in Psalm 51, he's committed his sin with Bathsheba, and he's praying his prayer in Psalm 51, and what does he say to God? And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And people looked at that and said, man, David must have been worried about losing his salvation. If he's going to lose the Holy Spirit, he must not be saved any longer. So what do people conclude? If you sin, you might lose the Holy Spirit. If you sin and lose the Holy Spirit, you're not saved anymore. Well, that's thinking about it like us church-age believers. But David did not have the Holy Spirit to seal him until the day of redemption like we do. He did not have the Holy Spirit inside him as the guarantee or the down payment of his salvation. David had the Holy Spirit as the king of Israel. He had the Holy Spirit as God's anointed leader. So when we read, and take not my Holy Spirit from me, when we read that we should not think, and don't let me lose my salvation, instead when we read, take not my Holy Spirit from me, we need to think, David saying, God, don't give up on me as being your king. If you take your spirit from me, God, I'm going to be left to do this in my strength. If you take your Holy Spirit from me, you're going to put your spirit on a replacement, on someone else, and I'm not going to be king anymore. When he said, don't take your spirit from me, he didn't think, I don't want to lose my salvation. Because the Spirit was not poured out on all flesh. David did not have the Holy Spirit because he was saved. He had the Holy Spirit at times because he was Israel's chosen leader. No different than Samson having it in the book of Judges and then the prophets. Ezekiel, in, in his book, the Holy Spirit comes on Ezekiel and moves him to different places. Have you ever read that? We were joking the other morning, somebody made a, a comment about Star Trek. It's almost like, like Scotty was beaming Ezekiel in different places. Those of you that never watched Star Trek probably have no idea what I mean by that. But you remember on the, on the Starship Enterprise when Scotty would beam people up and beam them down? And so Ezekiel's here, and then one minute he's all the way over here because the Spirit of God moved him. So the Spirit of God would come on Ezekiel and put him physically where he wanted him to be. The Holy Spirit would come to the prophets and give them a message. When we read, and the word of the Lord came to me and said, that may well be the Holy Spirit of God coming to them. Now, I know the word is Jesus, according to John 1, 14, as the word became flesh. But when the word of the Lord would come in them and whisper something into their ear, that may just as easily have been the Holy Spirit of God, as opposed to, uh, like, sometimes where Jesus would come in them in a bodily form. I think if they got a message just kind of whispered to their heart, I think that may well have been the Holy Spirit of God doing that. So the Spirit of God in the Old Covenant might have gone to a, a priest, might have gone to a prophet, and given them information. Might have gone to a king and given them wisdom like he did with King Solomon. Might have put them in a place where they needed to be in that moment like he did with Ezekiel. Might have gone on a person to empower them to do something mighty like he did with Samson. But we have to understand that when Joel wrote these words, the Holy Spirit was not on every believer at that time. He was on individuals. He'd come and go, and he would do temporary things with them. 
So Joel says, there's going to be a day after that, he says, down the road, not yet, sometime in the future, when God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. That would be exciting to me. If I was in the Old Testament days and I heard one of God's prophets say that, there's going to be a time when all of us can have God's spirit poured out on us, not just within us, but poured out. You think about pouring something out. You pour yourself a glass of sweet tea or you pour yourself a cup of coffee. You just watch it fill right on up to the top. And God's going to pour his spirit out on us. I think filling us up to the brim, giving us as much as we can handle. Man, that would be exciting to me. But it wasn't happening in Joel's day. But that sets the tone for what he's talking about. So if we understand what the Holy Spirit did in the Old Covenant, number two, we can look and see what the Holy Spirit did in the New Covenant. And for that, I invite you to the book of Acts, chapter 2. We go from Joel 2 to Acts 2, and we see Joel's vision, at least partially realized here. Acts 2, we're going to start reading in verse 17. Now, I certainly don't believe that this is something that we are supposed to do. I don't believe it's anything we are 
told to do or instructed to do, but that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost, isn't it? The Holy Spirit came, and how did everybody know he came? Well, because the immediate sign was they were speaking in tongues. Now, there was a sound of a rushing, mighty wind. That shouldn't surprise us. In both Hebrew and Greek, the word wind and breath and spirit are the same. So it makes sense that when God's spirit comes, there will be a sound of wind or breath accompanying the coming of the spirit. So they heard the sound of the spirit, and then what did they see? On top of everybody's heads, the Bible says in Acts that there were cloven tongues of fire resting on their heads. What does that mean? I have no idea. If you're looking for a description of that, I can't give you one. And, and anybody that comes up with something is guesswork. We have no idea what cloven tongues of fire would look like. We don't know who all saw them. Just the 120? Or did all the unbelievers that saw them see the tongues of fire? We don't know. We can only speculate. I would imagine that only the believers could see it. We don't know what that really even looked like, though. But kind of like what day of the week Jesus died really doesn't matter. The important thing is that it happened, not necessarily how we describe what it looked like. But they hear the sound of wind, they see the sight of fire, and then there's the speaking in tongues. Now, tongues. In, uh, in Greek, according to the book of Acts, because that's in Greek, the, the word there is glossa, when they spoke in tongues. Glossa. It gives us our English word glossary. You know what a glossary is? It's a, a collection of known languages. You're not going to find gibberish in a glossary. So when we talk about a glossary, we're talking about languages, like Spanish, French, Mandarin, whatever it may be, real, actual languages that people speak. Now, you might not speak it, but somebody does. It's a real language, and, and you know, the person that speaks it can understand it. But for them, this, this glossa that they began to speak in, by definition, it can only mean a known language and nothing else. If Joel wanted them to talk about speaking in gibberish, he could have said that. If Peter recognized it as gibberish, he could have said gibberish. If Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, thought they were speaking gibberish, he could have said it was gibberish, but they chose to use a word that referred to known languages. So what's happening here today at Pentecost? Remember, it's a, it's a holiday. And because it's a holiday, Jews from around the world were required, or at least strongly encouraged, to go to Jerusalem on that day. So you have people from various countries. When we trace Paul's journey, Paul goes into these other countries. And whenever he's there, he goes into the synagogue first. What does that mean? There's Jews in these other countries. So whether he goes all the way to Asia, he sees <coughs> Jews. You know, whether he goes to some of the surrounding countries in the Middle East, he sees Jews. These are people that speak a variety of languages. We don't know what all Peter spoke, but I would imagine he was not a languages expert. Okay, he probably spoke Greek and Aramaic. That was probably the extent of what Peter knew. There are people that are speaking languages that Peter probably had never heard before. But you know what happens when the Spirit falls and they begin to speak glossa, they begin to speak in known languages? Everyone hears it in their own language. Now, let's just say that there was someone there from France, and they speak French and Peter doesn't. Does that mean that Peter starts speaking French? Or does that mean that Peter's speaking maybe Greek, and the man from France understands it in French? Uh, we don't really know that for sure. It did sound to some of the unbelievers that they were possibly drunk. And these people are full of new wine. And Peter said, no, 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 we're not drunk. But God's spirit has been poured out. So it seems like the unbelievers there were not able to understand what was going on. But it seems that the believers were each able to hear it in their own language. Peter's about to preach one of the best sermons ever recorded for us. He's about to stand up and connect the dots to these Jews from around the world that might not have ever even heard of Jesus. Imagine these Jews that had come from somewhere in Asia Minor. They didn't know about Jesus, didn't see the miracles, didn't know that the Pharisees were always trying to kill him. They just show up because it's the day of Pentecost and they're supposed to be there. And then Peter stands up and he preaches a sermon to them, and they're able to understand it somehow in their own language. This is a miracle that God worked for a special day, for a special time, so that everybody there was able to understand the gospel. It was imperative that these Jews from around the world came to Jerusalem that day and learned the truth about Jesus, that God had sent his Messiah to die and rise again. And guess what they could do? Go back home to their country with new information about the Son of God, and they could preach in their own language, in their own tongue, to their own people. 
So what about today? Do we have the gift of tongues today? Does God give one person a message where they stand up and speak gibberish, and then he gives another person an interpretation where they stand up and they tell us what it meant? Well, why do we have to do that? I mean, just an let's answer that second question before we answer the first. Why would God need you know, Matt to stand up here and speak in a bunch of gibberish? Only to have Tammy, we used you this morning, so we'll use Tammy again. Only to have Tammy stand up and say, here's what he said. Well, first of all, if God wanted to speak to us, he could do it the first time. We wouldn't need the interpreter. But secondly, God has spoken to us. How? By the book of Hebrews, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son. He's spoken to us now through his Holy Spirit. That's inside us like the glove. And more importantly, he's spoken to us in his word. 66 books he has given to us, and we can read what God wants us to know right here. You have any questions? It's right here. You have any questions? You get on your knees and you pray, and you let the Holy Spirit of God that now is poured out on all flesh, you let the Holy Spirit of God speak to your heart to lead you in the truth, as Jesus said. We don't need someone to get a message of gibberish and then to get an interpreter and interpret that for us. God has spoken to us through his Son, through his Spirit, and through his scriptures. And I believe that's all that we need. Now, I've been in churches where what I just described has taken place. I've been there and seen it happen. I've seen some person get up and how about how blah, 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 and then somebody stands up and says, you know, he just said to pass the plates again, we need more money, you know, or whatever it might be. <laughs> now, that would be in a Baptist church. Right? <laughs> but but I, I've seen this stuff happen, and I look at that like, this, this is just goofy. This, this is Chaos. It doesn't seem like it's what God would do. Now, why did he do it back then? Well, we know why he did it at Pentecost, what I just said. But you might be thinking, well, didn't it happen in, in the next few books of the Bible? Didn't Paul talk about that? Didn't Paul speak in tongues? Absolutely. This is part of that transitional phase. This is part of that transitioning from old covenant to new covenant. This is part of making sure that the gospel is spreading around the world in a very short amount of time. But I believe that things like healing ministry, even exorcism of demons. I believe things like raising the dead and some of the things that we see in the New Testament, and right along with that, some of the dreams and visions and speaking in tongues, I believe those things were necessary for a time, and I believe that they have faded away. Does that mean that God never uses that stuff? I'm not saying that. I told before about a friend of mine in, in high school when we were uh, we were out going uh, door to door with our youth group, knocking on doors, inviting people to church and stuff. There was a man in Orlando who didn't speak a word of English, and one of the girls in our youth group suddenly, out of nowhere, spoke fluent Spanish to this man, shared the gospel with him, and led him to Christ. And when we were done, she turned around. Like, it was all over. She just said, I can't believe that just happened. That was the weirdest thing. And so, it wasn't gibberish, though. It was Spanish. It was a glossa. It was a known language. So I'm not going to put God in the box and say, oh, he doesn't do that stuff anymore. I believe if it's necessary, God will use it. But I also believe that now we have churches in, in, I mean, every corner of this world. We have Bible translators working to get the gospel everywhere. Now, in the places where we still don't have that stuff, God can do whatever God wants to do, what needs to do. And we can bring in people from remote jungles and third world countries. I can tell you stories like I was laid in bed one night, and I just knew that that the God of Islam must not be real. And I said, God, if you're real, reveal yourself. And then I had a vision, and a man dressed in white said, my name is Jesus, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. I hear stories like that all the time coming from missionaries out of these countries. So I'm not saying God doesn't do that stuff. I believe he does whatever is necessary so that all may hear the gospel message. But does he want us all to speak in tongues every time we gather on Sundays? I don't think so. I don't think there's any use for that. Does he want us all to start getting slain in the spirit, start doing backflips, start running laps through the building? Because when I've been in charismatic churches, that's what they do. They'll start singing songs and get those tambourines a-going. And about the fourth or fifth verse of the same song, they'll all start getting worked up into a frenzy. And I've seen people just start running laps through the building. I've seen people just fall over backwards and shake like they had a seizure saying, oh, I'm getting the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm thinking, that's a gift from Jesus? I don't know if that's really what I want right now from Jesus. I mean, I've, I've got some prayer requests, but falling over backwards and seizing has never been one of them. But they just later say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. For what? I mean, I think all that stuff is done to draw attention to themselves. Hey, look how holy I am. The Holy Spirit has knocked me over. What's he done for you lately? Well, anybody can fall over backwards and say, thank you, Jesus. Anybody can run laps around the building. But what in the world is that for? 
God is not the author of confusion, and that stuff is chaos. It's man-centered. It says, look at me while I'm running around the building. Look at me, everybody. But what were they doing on Pentecost when they spoke in tongues? They were saying, look at Jesus. Look at the cross. Peter says, this Jesus who you crucified has come back to life, and he is the Son of God. It was all about pointing people to Jesus. If we speak in some kind of tongue that God allows us to do, it better be to point people to Jesus. If we have visions or, or dreams, I'm not saying you're not going to get one from God, but if you get one and you share it, it better be about pointing somebody to Jesus. If it's man-centered, if it's look at me and how spiritual I am, because God chose to appear to me instead of you, that's man-centered. That's saying, look at me. It seems every time I've heard of a person that has some kind of vision like this, God is always bragging on them, telling them why they are the one that has been chosen to do something. I woke up 2 a.m. and I looked and God was sitting on the foot of my bed. And God looked at me and he said, Brother Bill, you know, you're the one that I... Come on. If, if God's going to give us a vision, it's probably going to be about helping somebody see the gospel, not sitting on our bed and waking us up and telling us why he's chosen us. That's how cults get started, right? Because if you draw that out, the cult leader then goes on and says... He told me to write this down, or he told me where to find these scrolls, or he told me where the other gospel or the New Testament is going to be. And that's how cults get started. But God has already given us his word. I don't think there's anything left he needs to communicate to us. And especially us here in America, saturated in God's word, a church across the street from a church, like Starbucks in Seattle, in South Carolina, we have a church across from the church, right? They are everywhere. We have Bibles everywhere. We don't need tongues. We don't need visions. We don't need dreams. We don't need people to prophesy some new word. We've got all the information we need right here. The question is, are we carrying that simple message to our coworkers, to our neighbors, to our friends and family? We don't need to speak in tongues to reach our coworkers, do we? We just need to use English and tell them about Jesus. Tell them about their sin and point them to the book of John. We just need to tell them the good news that's already been recorded for us. In fact, near the end of Paul's life, he finds himself in prison, and there's a man with him named Epaphroditus. And Paul is worried about Epaphroditus because he's sick. And he's been sick for a long time, and we don't know how long, but he writes this letter to the church and says, Guys, I think Epaphroditus is getting better. I know you've been wondering why he's been gone so long. Evidently, he carried uh, an offering to Paul, a love offering. And he got sick while he was there, and he got delayed a long time. So Paul wrote this letter and says, he's on the mend. I think he's getting better, but I just want you guys to know that. And I'm reading this wondering, well, if Paul can just heal everybody, why didn't he just heal Epaphroditus? But evidently, at the end of Paul's life, even his own ability through the Holy Spirit to heal was already beginning to subside. Why? The New Testament's just about finished. He's written most of it. It's almost done. And, and as the New Testament is being completed for us, it seems the ability to heal is also winding down. And I believe with that, speaking in tongues and visions and prophecy and all those things that, that go along with it, I'm not saying God doesn't use that. But we better be selective in what we believe that stuff to be. We better not think it's any kind of man centered chaos. We better make sure that it's always used to give God the credit to point people to the faith. So, I don't think we need that stuff but I do believe that God can use it if he wants to. Now, when we read through the book of Acts, we see the rest of the things that, that Joel talks about. When we read through Acts, we see people having visions. We see people having dreams. In the book of Acts, we see uh, people like uh, Agabus having a vision. We see the daughters of Philip who were called prophetesses. Feminine. We see people in the book of Acts like Cornelius and Peter having dreams, and they recognize those dreams to be from God. Peter's vision of the sheep coming down with all kinds of formerly unclean animals. And the Lord says, kill them and eat them, Peter. Cornelius has a vision. Send for Peter that he may come and tell you about me. They have these visions from God, but they're about salvation, aren't they? There's nothing man-centered about it. So this is where you and I are today. We find ourselves, I mentioned earlier, being in the church age. But we also call this the last days. You believe we're living in the last days? I certainly believe it. I mean, the Lord can come back. There's nothing else we're waiting for. He could come back before we have our closing prayer night. He could rapture this church. But when Peter said these words, he was living in the last days. See, if we were to look at a timeline, 
the, from, from the ascension of Christ when he went back to heaven and the day of Pentecost, kind of these two things together, ushered in the time which we now live, referred to as the last days. We said, oh, we're in the last days. No, I believe it. But we're in the last days as much as Peter was in the last days. 2,000 years ago, they began, now obviously we're 2,000 years closer, but this began the era known as the last days. After Jesus went back to heaven, this church age, we were in the last days. When does the last days end? It ends with the return of Christ. Now, the return of Christ is also a broad thing. It's, like I said last week, it's the rapture, it's the tribulation, it's the second coming. All that together is the return of Christ. So we are in these last days. And in these last days, we've seen part of what Joel has said come to pass. We've seen the Spirit poured out. We've seen dreams and visions in the book of Acts. We've seen people prophesy. But what about the last things he mentioned? The sun and the moon and the, st the uh, stars in the sky. Have we seen any of that stuff yet? Well, that brings us to the final thing we're going to look at tonight, and that is the Holy Spirit in the end times. We looked at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and now let's look ahead into the future and see the Holy Spirit in the end times. I invite you to Matthew 24. We will be done in just a couple of minutes, I promise. In Matthew 24, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. We're going to look at verse 29 down to 31. This portion of scripture here is known as the Olivet Discourse. It's Jesus teaching his disciples from the Mount of Olives about the signs of his return, what's going to precede his coming. Verse 29, Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, so this is after the tribulation, after the great tribulation of Revelation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. He's quoting from Joel. Then will appear in heaven the signs of the Son of Man, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So Jesus is now speaking of what I said ends these last days. The return of Christ. So Peter quotes Joel and connects it to where we are in the last days, and he says most of what Joel has said, but Peter doesn't mention the sun becoming dark. He doesn't mention the moon not giving light. He doesn't mention stars falling, and yet Jesus mentions those things as part of the future, immediately after the tribulation. So we're going to have the rapture. Could be tonight. That's going to begin a seven-year period. And then right before the end of that, right before he comes, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus gives us some physical signs to look for in the sky. Now, if this is a poetic way of understanding it, we could debate that. Uh, you know, are the stars literally going to fall to the earth? That's debatable. I, I imagine it's like Jesus says it's going to be. But Jesus says these are going to be the signs, and this is something that is future for us still. Now, I don't plan on living through it. I don't know if you plan on being around for it or not. I plan on going to heaven in the rapture if I'm alive. Uh, I don't plan on living through the tribulation, and so I'm not going to witness this part firsthand, but Jesus is certainly quoting Joel here when he talks about the end times. Previously in this passage, he told the disciples, there's going to be apostasy, a great falling away from the faith. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be crazy weather. You want an example of crazy weather? How about on Monday, there'll be rain mixed with snow flurries. On uh, Thursday, you'll get eight inches of rain. Overnight, maybe some tornadoes will touch down. And this Saturday, about two hours of snow. On Tuesday, it was like, what, 65 degrees? Wasn't this the weirdest week of weather you've ever seen in your life? I can't remember anything weirder than the week we just had. Jesus says you're going to see crazy weather, and then he says these final things that you're going to see, the sun, the moon, and the stars. Apostasy? Check. We certainly have a falling away, don't we? And people not going to church like they used to. Look around. People not going to church like they used to, are they? We, we're not praying in public schools anymore. We're not you know, beginning things with a word of prayer like we used to. Certainly apostasy. Wars and rumors of wars? Yeah, check. Like in the book of Exodus, when the Amalekites attacked the Israelites. Right? We've had wars and rumors of wars from the beginning. Crazy weather? Yeah, yesterday and all of last week. We can check that one off. But these last things that Jesus said, these are what will precede the second coming. So I think that we are getting close to the rapture 
and that return of Christ. And then these will be the final things that people have to look for before they know that the Son of Man will return. Now, what does Jesus say? That they will mourn when the Son of Man returns. Now, we don't mourn at the rapture, do we? We're excited about the rapture, but they will mourn. Why? Because as I close, let's keep it all in context and I'll be done. What's Joel's primary point in the whole book? He says it five times. He talks about the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. He says it five times. And that's what we looked at last week. So Joel gives all this about pouring out the Spirit in connection with the day of the Lord. Joel is talking about judgment. They're going to go to the valley of Jehoshaphat, where Yahweh is judged. They're going to be judged in that valley. And I believe that's Megiddo, Armageddon, we talked about last week. Joel was talking about judgment. And so when Jesus says these things are going to happen, he quotes from Joel, and then everyone will mourn. Why? Because he's coming in judgment. When he comes back, he's coming with that sword, like we talked about last week. He's coming to execute judgment. There will be very few believers on the earth at this time. The majority, the vast majority, will be unbelievers. And he's coming in Jehoshaphat. He's coming to be the judge. No wonder they're going to mourn. No reason for you to mourn if you're right with God tonight. No reason for you to mourn if your sins are forgiven. No reason for you to mourn if you know that you know that you know that you're saved. And remember that last verse we read, chapter 3, verse 1 of Joel. And you're probably not there, probably in Matthew or Acts or something in that time. But he closed by talking about, or we closed by him talking about how the fortunes of Israel and Judah will be restored. It'll be a good time after that when he restores the fortunes. But he's coming in judgment first, and that's why we must be ready. So tonight we see God's Holy Spirit available to us. He's the hand inside the glove. If you were filled with God's Spirit, I hope you're doing something about it because some of the people that we might not reach, they may be mourning when the Son of Man returns. If they get left behind, and if they can somehow make it to the end, then they may see Jesus come back with a sword, they come back in judgment. We don't want that for anybody. So let's be filled by God's Spirit. He's poured out on all flesh. Let Him be the hand inside the glove. Let Him use you to accomplish His will. So wherever he sings, we go. Whatever he says, we do. Let's obey him in whatever he has for us. Filled with the Spirit, using our spiritual gifts, you producing the fruit of the Spirit to be the people that God wants us to be. I'm going to ask you to stand up tonight. And before we dismiss, I know we don't have anyone on the piano tonight. But, but similar to what we've done many a Sunday night, we'll, we'll just have a time where you can pray right where you are, even in the, the silence of the moment, and that's okay. But maybe God has laid something on your heart tonight. Maybe you are a spirit-filled Christian, but you've quenched the spirit. Maybe you've not allowed him to use you. Maybe you know you have a spiritual gift, but you haven't been faithfully using it. And maybe tonight you want to pray and say, God, would you help me to use the gift that you've given me? Fill me up. Pour your spirit into me and use me, God. Maybe tonight there's something else in your heart and you want to use this opportunity to talk to God about whatever he may be impressing upon you. So, Lord, I pray right now in these next few minutes that maybe your Holy Spirit is convicting someone of something they're not doing or challenging someone to do something better. Maybe, Lord, even leading someone to evaluate themselves and work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Lord, if that's what you're doing right now, I pray that we would be sensitive to your leading. I pray that we would use this time to speak to you. And I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. For just a minute, just in the silence, use this opportunity to pray about whatever may be on your heart tonight. Dismiss us on a word of prayer before you do. If anybody's able to give us a, just a few minutes of help in the gym, we really appreciate that. Dear Heaven.